everyone, welcome to Logan's Mosh Pick. Glad to have you here. Do me a favor and please subscribe if you haven't already. Also consider joining my Patreon page for some cool perks. I'll leave a link in the description. Let's launch into a new episode of Rock and Read. Today we'll read chapter 11 of Red by the Red Rocker, Sammy Hagar. Chapter 11 is called So Long, Sammy. When Ruffler died, we auditioned managers. I wanted Shep Gordon and Johnny Barbas. Shep was Alice Cooper's brilliant manager, and Barbas was one of the best-liked people in the business. Ran labels, was pals with U2, Elton John, everybody. The brass at Warner Brothers liked the idea. We met with them. The brothers didn't like them. I called David Geffen and he suggested his old partner Elliot Roberts, Neil Young's manager. We met with him too and the Van Halens blew him out in about five seconds. Ed and Al wound me up for two months auditioning people before they told me they wanted Ray Daniels. He was married to Al's wife's sister and managed Rush. They told me I got my man last time and they wanted their guy this time. Ray Daniels had been working in the background the whole time. Before he was even our manager, Ray Daniels had told the Van Halen brothers about a publishing deal Leffler made on the live album that I didn't know anything about. It was no big deal, but Ray Daniels made the brothers think they had been screwed. They made me pay them back a substantial sum. Alex Van Halen never wrote a song in his life, and he was taking the same amount of publishing money as me. Daniels gained the confidence of the brothers that he was going to be on their side, not mine. Ed and Al were really going against me at this stage. They thought Leffler and I them. We didn't those guys. We saved them. They made ten times more money in one year than they'd ever made in any year before we came into the band. Nobody anybody. I told Ray to his face, they're going to sign with you. I'm not. You get zero of my money. The deal I made was they paid management. I didn't pay management. He didn't do for me. He wasn't my manager. I would find my own manager. I did not like the guy. I wanted to bite his face off. And he was scared of me. He didn't want to come into a room with me. He stayed away from me, always holding meetings with Eddie. Ray Daniels went to Warner Brothers and renewed our contract. He negotiated a few extra points for the band's early albums, the ones I wasn't on. Other than that, nothing changed. He renegotiated the same deal we had to begin with, except for one thing. When I joined Van Halen, Ed Leffler had put in the contract that after every Van Halen record, I had the right to do a Sammy Hagar solo record for big money. I only did the one. Ed Leffler called it my golden parachute. Somehow, they took that out. I walked into a dressing room backstage in Toronto. Ray Daniels was there with his briefcase. Ed and Al were signing papers with a notary. They were signing the record deal and they didn't even want my signature on it. Don't worry about it, Ray Daniels said. Ed and Al are all that matters in this band. A few months after Leffler died, the cokehead manager down in Cabo called in early 1994 to tell me he gave the keys to the employees and that the government had wrapped a yellow ribbon around the place and closed it down. I couldn't think what else to do, so I called Marco Monroy. Marco discovered the manager didn't pay any bills for the whole year. He spent all the money. Marco said the cantina owed around $300 thousand dollars. The place was trashed. The furniture was shot. The equipment broken. He wanted to be my partner. He offered to pay the debts and invest another hundred grand into fixing the place up. George, by now, was long gone. He hooked up with an American actress with some bad habits. The problem was that everything was in George's name. He was gone. We didn't know where the he was. It wasn't pretty. I needed to take complete control of the cantina. The Van Halens had already told me to shove the place up my ass, and after Leffler died, our relationship got even worse. I went to Ray Daniels and asked him if I could buy out the other partners. He was trying to get on my good side. He cooked up a plan with our accountant where they could get their money back by taking the loss. They wrote it off on their taxes. They gave it back to me after I agreed that if I ever built another one, they would have the first right of refusal to invest. If I sold it within five years, they would get their investment back. 
Although, that would be a little tricky after they already took it off their taxes. I had to indemnify them against the debts and any other legal problems. It was a little complex, but I went for it. Marco wanted to bring in someone he knew to manage the cantina. Tito was a tough hombre, married to a wealthy Mexican, Harris. They lived in a mansion Marco built. Tito cleaned house. He not only tightened up the staff, he got rid of the drug dealers and low wives who were hanging out at the place. Marco and I decided to get the title to the property back and get the business into shape. When we couldn't find George, we went to his ex-wife, who still lived with her kids in Cabo. We offered her $25,000. She didn't speak English, so we brought an interpreter. She got up and walked out. I have no idea why, because she ended up with nothing. We finally dug up George, and he hard-nosed us. He wanted 10%. Marco and I each gave up 5% to get him to sign off on everything. Before long, he came crawling back, asking for his job. He left the chick. He was straightened out. He moved back to Cabo, and we let him come in. He's been there ever since, and he's been, as much as Marco, a savior of the place. The town was all starting to come together. The big dream was really happening in Cabo. The road was paved now. There were more hotels. Three or four planes were coming in a day. The town was packed. From the first day, Marco and Tito really turned Cabo Wabo around. They cleaned the place up, made it nice, boom. Within the first month, we started making money. The place looked fantastic. We were putting money back into it and taking money out without any of our pockets. The first year, we made around 200 grand in profit. The brothers weren't happy. They started accusing me of running the place into the ground so that they'd give it back to me. I wish I were that smart. Scotty Ross, our tour manager, sort of a big mouth guy, came back from Cabo and walked into a Van Halen rehearsal and slapped my hand. Cabo Wabo was packed, dude, he said. You're making tons of money. The place looks great. The Van Halens weren't smiling. Mikey and I were still going down almost every other month. Mike was willing to roll with me. He was planning to go down with me for my birthday that year, but they wouldn't let Mike ever go again. Mike wasn't allowed to go to Cabo. They really thought I them. As Cabo was coming together, I was spending as much time as I could with Carrie. She and I just wanted to go do things. We spent every night together. We lived in Hawaii, Mexico, Mill Valley. We'd go to New York. We'd go to Malta. We went to Italy. We went anywhere we wanted to go. We had such synchronicity. We were walking around at the Hanna Ranch on Maui when the idea came up to get a parrot. We walked a little further, and there's a cage with some parrots. This one little gal came to the cage and rubbed her head against the bars like birds do. We cut a deal and took her back to our room. Her name was Spooch. That bird slept with us under the covers. As soon as we got home to Mill Valley, we were sitting in the backyard by the pool. We clipped Spooch's wings so she couldn't leave. She was sitting on our shoulders. Spooch was a Nande canoeer. And we were talking about how we had to get Spooch a boyfriend. When out of the sky flies a mother <laughs> Nande Canoer who lands on Spooch's cage. Spooch was talking to the bird. The bird went into the cage to drink some water. Boom. We got us another bird. We called him Spooky. He never got along with Spooch. They fought like crazy. And we eventually had to give him to Bucky. But that happened to us. Shortly after we got together, we were in Boca Raton, near where Carrie's father lived in Florida. She wanted to go see her father. He bought houses, would move in for six months, fix them up, move out, and rent them. We took a limo. It was more than an hour away and went out to dinner. In the limo after dinner, we smoked a fat one and started to get a little sexy in the back seat. We found her father's place around midnight, and Carrie grabbed the key from the top of the water heater. We let ourselves in, turned on the living room light, and started rolling around on the couch. I put my foot on the floor and, hey, stepped on a pair of men's shoes. I jumped up naked and turned on some more lights. There's a shirt across a chair, an ashtray with cigarettes in it. Somebody has rented the house and is living in it. We ran out of there, stoned on our asses, half naked, throwing on our clothes into the limo. Our hearts were pounding. We could have been killed, but we couldn't stop laughing. 
So many things happened with Carrie and me because we were in sync. With Betsy, I was living a lie. I was lying to her about everything, and I was therefore lying to other people on the phone because she could hear. I was this whole lie, so far out of sync that things weren't working out for me. As soon as I fell in love with Carrie, I opened up and never lied again. I felt spontaneous. I felt free. Everything we did was the right thing to do. Things came to us that we wanted. You would think it, and it would happen. We could laugh over anything. Another night, after we moved back to Mill Valley at the Sweetwater, the town's tiny rock club, I met Bob Weir, the Grateful Dead. Carrie and I ran across him sitting at a table with a girlfriend, drinking scotch straight out of a bottle. We sat and drank together until the place closed at 2 in the morning. Let's go to my house, he said. The smart thing to do is to have everyone come to your house and then they have to drive home. Not you. No, I said. Let's go to my house. He pulled into my driveway in this beat up old Corvette that hadn't been washed in years. My driveway is pretty wicked. There wasn't even a curb, just a sheer drop that goes down 250 feet. Bob brought a mason jar full of buds. His scotch was almost gone. We started smoking weed and continued drinking. We played a little guitar. He peed off the deck. About four in the morning, I'm wasted and shot. I told Bob it was time for them to go. We let them out the door and Carrie asked, wasn't I going to help him get out of the driveway? I didn't see it. He was Bob Weir of the Grateful Dead. He could take care of himself. I started up the stairs. A terrible loud scraping noise outside. Carrie's going, oh my god. And I come running back down. Instead of backing up and turning around, he had driven straight forward off the driveway, facing down the rear wheels off the ground. Carrie and I dashed out and sat on the trunk. He was sitting in the car next to his girlfriend looking dazed. I think I need to pull forward, he said. I told him to sit very still and have his girlfriend climb out carefully. She crawled out over the back and sat on the trunk with us. He climbed out after her. The car could have gone down in a second. No seatbelt, convertible, down the hill, he's dead. Bob Weir dead at Sammy Hagar's home. It was horrible and at five in the morning. I told him to walk home. He took his mason jar of buds and wandered off down the hill with his girlfriend. The next morning I had to meet some people and I was very hungover on about three hours of sleep. I backed out my Ferrari down the driveway trying to maneuver around his car and not knock it down the hill and broke off my god $1600 side mirror. I called a tow company. When we got home around 5 o'clock in the afternoon, the tow truck left a note saying they couldn't take the car. There wasn't enough room behind the car, and they were worried about pushing it over the hill. It took two tow trucks and three days to get that car off my driveway. I even paid for the tow truck. I was pissed at Bob, but Carrie and I only laughed. After a while, Carrie started wanting to settle down a little more in the house in Mill Valley. She started putting some of her own items in there. She had been living in Betsy's home, sleeping in Betsy's bed. She started making changes. I began to see her domestic side. Before long, she started talking about how she would like to have a baby. Andrew was about 10. I was reluctant. But when a woman says she wants to have a baby, you don't tell her no. But I wasn't into being a father again. Aaron was grown and living in Los Angeles, but Andrew was a heartbreaker. At first, Betsy wouldn't let me see him. She finally started letting him come up for weekends, but it was tough on the little guy. I'd catch him crying in his bedroom. The divorce was hard on Andrew. That's something I'll always carry with me. Being a father again didn't look all that attractive. Then I remember what Miss Kellerman had told me about moving to Northern California. Someday, you're going to have two daughters. I realized everything else Mrs. Kellerman said came true. Sure enough, just by bringing it up, Carrie got pregnant. We were in the jacuzzi out by the pool, middle of the day, and we threw it down right on the grass. I knew it. We made wedding plans. Carrie and I had been together almost four years. Leffler had been dead almost two years. The band had not toured since that last weekend in Costa Mesa. We had been working for months on a new Van Halen album, balance and I took a little break to get married in November 1995 we got married in Mill Valley at the amphitheater on top of Mount Tam beautiful sunny day my mom was happy Carrie's grandmother was there her mom all her family 
my pal Emeril Agassi, BAM! The great New Orleans chef flew out and cooked for the wedding. We got 10 pounds of white truffles imported from Italy. Ed and Al were there. Everybody posed for the picture in People magazine. Someone overheard someone talking to the brothers saying, This <laughs> making too much money. Eddie was supposed to be sober, but he wasn't, and he could be trouble. He couldn't drink around Valerie, and Ray Daniels was all concerned that we keep Eddie straight. I had taken Eddie to the Bridge School concert in 1993, the all-acoustic benefit for a school for children with severe learning disabilities run by my buddy Neil Young. I did a couple of the shows by myself, and I was terrified. I didn't lack confidence one bit, except for when I'm by myself with an acoustic guitar, and then I'm a wreck. Neil Young is a fearless musician. He starts stomping his foot, slapping his guitar, and singing at the top of his lungs. He doesn't have any inhibitions. James Taylor was sweet backstage. Sammy, what do you mean you're nervous, he said. We all want to be like you. What do you mean, I said. Scared? The year I brought Eddie, the headline act was Simon and Garfunkel. Eddie and I were both very nervous, but we did well. Three songs on piano, and Eddie played a solo on this tiny amp with a kind of acoustic setup, and he was great. We didn't go over as well as you might have expected, but it wasn't our crowd. We went back to our trailer, and we did some blow. Paul Simon was in the trailer next to ours, and I started talking with him while Eddie was getting more trash. He finally wandered out to see what was happening. Paul Simon invited him to play in a song. Do you know Sound of Silence, he said. No, I never heard of it, says Eddie. Simon took him in the trailer and tried to show him the song. He was supposed to be on stage in about 20 minutes. Eddie couldn't get it. I guess he was too wasted. Wait, he said. What key again? He tried his finger tapping to the song. Eddie's a great musician, but very methodical. He doesn't simply jam those things. He finds the melody and plays that. He was looking for the melody while Paul was singing and playing him through the song, and he couldn't get it. Never mind, Eddie, Simon said. No, 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 said Eddie, leaning over his guitar again. Simon finally dashed off to the stage and did call out Eddie, who went out there and butchered the song. We were making the balance record, but it was over for Van Halen. If it wasn't for the producer, Bruce Fairbairn, we never would have finished that record. He had to throw Eddie out what seemed like every night. Eddie would come in seeing me drunk and up. You'd go into the bathroom in the studio and there'd be a hole in the wall. Reach down and there was a bag of cocaine. A bottle of vodka was underneath the sink. Chewing gum and cigars were everywhere. Al, I'd say, your brother's up. What is this bull? Everybody's saying he's clean and sober. The guy's ripped out of his brain. You're crazy, Al would say. That's just the way Ed acts. I'd get in Eddie's face. Ed, get the out of here. You're up. I don't want you in here while I'm working. I'm doing my vocals. Get the out of here. I haven't had a drink for five months, you mother. He said. He'd break down and cry, bust up things. It got ugly. Fairbairn and I were staying at the Bel Air Hotel, and the times when Eddie became thoroughly disruptive, he would call the session, and the two of us would drive back to the hotel together, sit in the bar, eat a bite, and drink a couple of cocktails. Eddie was really on edge, because, number one, he needed a hip replacement and was taking painkillers all the time, and number two, it seemed like he was drinking and hiding it from everybody. When I started to do my vocals, Eddie, for the first time ever, started making suggestions about how I should sing. That got out of hand so quickly that Bruce took me to Vancouver to finish the vocals myself. I knew they were trying to get rid of me. Eddie was trying to make me quit. He would find something wrong with every lyric I'd write. He never said a word about a lyric before. Suddenly, he didn't like anything. That's wimpy, he said. Make it don't tell me what love can do. I had this strong, positive thought. I want to show you what love can do, but Eddie wanted to switch it around. I want this. No, I want that. Okay, I'll go with this. No, I want that. Okay, I wanted this to begin with. You know what? I want that. It would drive me crazy. The brothers were dead against me. I wrote that song, Don't Tell Me What Love Can Do, about Kurt Cobain. 
I wanted it to say, I want to show you what love can do. Ed and Al fought me on that. They wanted more of a grungy, bad attitude song. Don't tell me what love can do. That's not what I had in mind. I was talking about somebody who could have saved Kurt Cobain's life. I do believe that. You can save people. Drugs kill people. People think drugs are what made Jimi Hendrix great. No, drugs are what killed Jimi Hendrix. Kurt Cobain could have been saved. The people around him let him go for some reason. They had to have seen that coming. So I wrote that song about it to say, You have control over your destiny. It's your life. You can do what you want. But then I wanted the chorus to say, But I want to show you what love can do. I wanted to make it a love song. Not about me and Kurt Cobain, but about what people could have done for him. People that he knew and loved. Carrie was pregnant and they hated me being so happy. I kept telling Carrie I had to get out of the band, but I didn't want to quit. I saw what they did to the other guys. They will lie. They will crucify me. They will kill me with the fans. The fans went against Roth. He died a quick death as a solo artist. Maybe not instantly. He had a brief moment when he first went solo, but it didn't take long. I didn't want that to happen to me. It didn't help that my ex-brother-in-law Bucky died about three weeks before the Balance Tour started in March 1995. It was a heartbreaker. Bucky and Joel had divorced, and for a while he and his son Ben had been living together on a houseboat in Sausalito with Bucky's new girlfriend Penny, a great gal who used to be Jeff Beck's old lady. Bucky lived for his kid, and when Ben died in a car crash, a bunch of kids riding in the back of a pickup truck on the way to Stinson Beach, and Ben was the only one killed, the bottom fell out of Bucky's life. My lawyer sued the city over the accident and came up with a fair-sized settlement for Bucky. When Bucky died from an OD, they found the check crumpled in his fist. By the time we went on tour that March, the Van Halen brothers were both in terrible shape. Al came out of the tour in a neck brace because of a ruptured vertebrae. Al collapsed in the hotel lobby the day of our dress rehearsal in Pensacola, Florida. His hands went numb and down he goes. He started seeing osteopaths every day, getting these crazy adjustments. In Paris, the doctor put on rubber gloves and stuck his hand up Al's ass to work the lower vertebrae. If that wasn't enough, he and his wife were separated. The beginning of another divorce for Al, he was under a lot of pressure. Eddie seemed like he was on painkillers most of the time and was facing a total hip replacement due to a vascular necrosis, a bone disease often associated with alcoholism. Eddie walked with a cane. His hips were shot. He would walk up to the stage, put the cane down, and walk out. Every so often, he would sit on the drum riser or a stool to play a couple songs because his hips were killing him so bad. On the final leg of the balance tour, Ray Daniels booked the band open for Bon Jovi at football stadiums in Europe in May and June 1995. It was a total disaster. Van Halen had no place on a bill with Bon Jovi, who was huge over there. They did three nights at Wembley Stadium in London, 80,000 people a night, and there were about 10,000 people in the front going nuts when we played, and about 60,000 teeny boppers in the back waiting for Bon Jovi. As soon as we finished playing, our band left, and the Bon Jovi kids came to the front of the stage. It was total oil and water. Nothing against Don Bon Jovi. He and I went to dinner many times on this tour, but it was the worst idea ever ever for Van Halen. We got nowhere on that tour. I could feel the end coming. Still, Van Halen rocked. We would play a killer show, walk off stage together hugging and laughing, and what a great show we just played, and the next day it would be back to the same <laughs> We flew separately to Japan to do the last shows on that tour. We stayed in different hotels. About 2 o'clock in the morning, Eddie called. He had wiped out his mini bar, wasted on his ass clean and sober. Those were almost the last shows. On the way home, we were stopping for four nights in Hawaii, but then we'd be done. What are you going to do when we get back, he said. The Ronnie Montrose story all over again. I don't know, I said. Take some time off. What are you going to do? I don't know yet, he said. When I figure it out, I'll let you know. I've got some plans, but I'll let you know if it involves you or not. Okay, I said. You, I said. I hung up the phone. 
We went to Hawaii to play the last shows. Carrie and I decided on an impulse to buy a house. We've been renting places every year for three months from Thanksgiving through like January or February. We were on our way to the airport and I called a realtor. I told him I wanted something private, on the ocean, lots of acreage, a guest house, a pool, and total privacy. I want to be naked. I want fruit trees. He took us to see this place on a cliff on Maui. We bought the house on the spot and decided that when the tour was over, we would move to Hawaii to have the baby. We were going to have this baby through natural childbirth. I wanted to deliver it. I wanted to have the baby and take a long break from the band. As soon as the tour ended, the brothers started calling every day. We had just gotten off tour. We just did a record and a world tour and those crazy wanted to go in and do a song for the movie Twister. I was not down with it. All they wanted was to get me off the island. Ray Daniels would be on the phone saying things like, If you're not back tomorrow, we're assuming that you've quit the band. I talked to the film director on the phone. He sent me the script. There were some key words. Drop down was one phrase. That are used by Twister Chasers. I wrote these great lyrics for a song called Drop Down. I cut a little demo over there and the director loved it. Told me I told the whole story in three minutes. They hated it. Al and Eddie told me it was stupid to write about the movie. I told them I had been working with the director. He doesn't know what he's talking about, they said. We don't like it. Get over here. If you're not here tomorrow, we're assuming you quit the band. Carrie was so pregnant that she was ready to pop, and I was flying home. I flew my mom over, and I flew back. This was about the fifth time I had to fly back to the mainland. I wrote new lyrics. Bruce Fairbairn was waiting for me. Eddie wanted to call the song Human Beings. I wrote all these belligerent lyrics. Lemmings breeding. There is just enough Christ in me to make me feel almost guilty. Because we are humans. Humans being. I was ready to fly back to Hawaii the next day. But they told me they wanted me to stay and work on another song for the Greatest Hits record. I told them I wasn't doing any songs for any Greatest Hits record and split. I went back to my hotel room and changed my name at the front desk. I didn't want to call Carrie at 4 in the morning and tell her. Eddie was trying to call me all night. Security knocked on my door to tell me they had Eddie Van Halen on the phone and he wants to know what room I'm in. What do you want us to do? The guy asked. Tell him to go himself, I said. That's when they called Roth. The Greatest Hits album was Ray Daniels' idea. They wanted some quick bucks. I thought if we're going into the studio, let's do a whole record, but they wanted the Greatest Hits record. Then he gets another genius idea. Let's get David Lee Roth back, do two new songs with him, two new songs with Sammy, and we'll be bigger than God. They did the whole thing behind my back. I was thrown out of the band for not going along with it. I went back to Maui the next morning. Carrie was way pregnant. We talked it over. In another few days, she wouldn't be able to fly anymore. We agreed going back was the best thing to do. Back in Mill Valley, we went to see the pediatrician who delivered Aaron and Andrew, and he told us the baby was breached and would have to be delivered by C-section. Forget that I was going to deliver the baby in water and all the stuff we learned at LeMay's class in the church in Hawaii. She would have to have been helicoptered to a hospital. It turned out to be a good thing that we went back. My first son, Aaron, was born. I wasn't even in the room because we were on welfare. Dave Wasser and I were out in the park eating fish and chips, and no one even told me. I finally went and checked. When Andrew was born, I was right there. He was such a surprise because I was certain he was going to be a girl. We painted the room for a girl. We bought girl clothes. The baby shower was all girls presents. Even the doctor said it was probably going to be a girl. I burst out laughing in joy. A child is a child and when it's your child, it changes your life. I think it was the most joyful moment in my life. Until Kama came. When Kama came, it was even more of a joy because I actually took her out and cut the umbilical cord. Carrie came home with our daughter from the hospital and the next day was Father's Day 1996. We were lying in bed around 9 in the morning with the baby when the phone rang. It was Eddie Van Halen. He had been up all night. You've never been a team player, he said. You never want to do things when we want to do them. You always want to be a solo artist. You can go back to being a solo artist. We've been working with Roth on the Greatest Hits record, and it's going great. They had been working with him behind my back while I was in the hospital with my wife having a baby. I went off. You, you. Mother. I said and hung up. 
They couldn't take me being happy for one more minute. They had to get rid of me. It irritated them so bad that I was so happy. I had my little girl, my wife, and was living the happiest life on the planet. I called Ray Daniels. Eddie just called me and said you've been working with Roth, I said. Oh no, Daniel said. He didn't make the call, did he? Yes, he did, dude. What do you want me to do, he asked. Go yourself for starters, I said. Second of all, congratulations. You just broke up the biggest band in the world. That's going to be a big feather in your cap. I went off on his ass. Let me talk to him first, Daniel said. Don't take that attitude. You. It's over, I said. Eddie always said I quit, and maybe I did. His attitude was I always wanted to be a solo artist. They even attacked my work ethic. He and Alex told Kurt Loder of MTV News that I didn't want to work. I remember reading one article where Eddie said he was a lot older than us and I don't think he really wanted to work like we did. I gave them their Van Halen Rings trademark. They gave me my Cabo Wabo brand. I kept my royalties. I was a 30% partner in that band since they had already knocked Michael Anthony down to 10%. Things that put a stick up my ass made me take action. I think sometimes I'm at my best when I have something to prove. When I joined Van Halen, I was burnt out and finished with the business. I didn't even want to be creative at that point. When I replaced their first singer and was taking from everybody, putting myself on the spot, it lit a fire. I'll show these mother. I became really driven in that band and we did some amazing things, even at the end. Even our last record, Balance, was a great record. I'm an adrenaline and inspiration junkie. If something inspires me, I will get up for it. With inspiration, I can do anything. When I was kicked out of Van Halen, I was determined to show those mother that they made the biggest mistake of their lives. Well, that's the end of chapter 11. Let me know what you thought of chapter 11 in the comments below. Before I go, I want to give a special shout out to my supporters on Patreon. Matt and Stacy from Canada. That does it for today's video, guys. I hope you enjoyed. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you haven't already. I really appreciate the support. I'll see you next time. Till then, rock on.